Are you searching for fulfillment? <laughs> Discover true happiness. Stay tuned to Shalom World. My vocation is a gift. I'm happy because God chose me. Part of my mission is to help the people, local people, to discover God already present among them. I am Father Ignacio. I am a Mexican priest. I am uh, the eldest uh, son of six children, mom and dad Catholics, devoted Catholics, from Mexico, from a little town called Guadalajara, which is the second biggest city in my country, Mexico. Since was, uh, I was small, I, I used to go to church uh, to have all the devotions that you can imagine because the region where I'm coming from is very devoted to Blessed Mother. We pray the Rosary. We have twice a year shrines or pilgrimage to, to visit Our Lady of Zapopan. Uh, so beautiful experiences. When I was 20 years old, I remember vividly, I was invited to attend a retreat, three days retreat. And uh, I encountered Jesus. It was the first time I encountered Jesus. I heard about Jesus for a long time, for 20 years. But when I was 20, I encountered him. He touched my heart and mind. And it was so, let us say, special this, this encounter that I remember that I wrote a letter. In this letter, I told him, Jesus, I want to belong to you. I want to become a priest. So. I wrote a letter and I burned the letter and I gave it to him practically. Uh, six months after, I fell in love and it was a personal conflict. What to do? I already promised Jesus. I want to be a priest. And now look at me, I am falling in love. So it was a, a moment of struggling and uh, I allowed myself to, to enter in this uh, healthy relationship, to know this uh, girl. But I realized that she didn't fulfill my inner need to be happy and to have inner peace, but especially to be close to God. Some reasons uh, didn't work out, but still I wanted to have a family. So it was very contradictory, but on one hand, I want to be a priest. On the other hand, I want to have a family. So I allow myself to have an other ex-girlfriend didn't work out. In the meantime, I was invited by a friend of mine to go to the poorest states in my country, in the south part of Mexico. And this state is called Chiapas. And uh, there is a big number of native people, the Mayans, uh, and so I went there. I prepared myself for practically one year in, during the Holy Week we try to evangelize these people, to learn from them as well, and to help them to identify Jesus' presence in their communities. It was an amazing experience. It was my first time to be away from my family. Now, talking to these native people and listening to these stories, that for instance, uh, a priest uh, was able to go to these places only once a year because it's so complicated to arrive to this in the middle of the jungle. And that struck me a lot. How they survive, and they were hungry for the Word of God, for the real presence of Jesus Christ, to receive His body and precious blood. And that inspired me to commit myself better for the community, for the people of God. So for five years, I belonged to this group of missionaries, lay missionaries, uh, under the 
administration and supervision of a Franciscan nuns. Every year I, I, I went to this place, my vocation was reinforced, and I remember the letter that I wrote when I was 20 years old. So at the end, um, I was reflecting deeply if I will continue searching for the future life, marriage life, or to look for become missionary. I remember one of our meetings preparing ourselves to go for the next mission. A close friend, a member of this uh, LAIF uh, missionary group told me, his name was Victor. He said, Ignacio, are you interested to join a missionary uh, congregation of priests and brothers? And I said, mm, I am not sure. Anyway, he left me a, a brochure and a magazine. The following day, the vocation promoter of this congregation called Scalabrinians, by the way, they work with migrants, sea first and refugees. He called me. And from that time on, I was engaged with the spirituality of this congregation. In the meantime, I have a girlfriend. So, but more and more I realized that God was leading me to give myself completely to Him. In other words, my love for Him was deeper and wider. On the other hand, even though I liked the other girl, but I realized that I couldn't compare the love of God with the love of a girl. And I needed to make a decision. Every time I tried to tell her, look, I need to talk to you about my call, my vocation, she stopped me. So I stopped the topic, the conversation, and I was struggling. But one day I decided to talk to her and to be standing firm with my sincere emotions and thoughts. So I told her, I'm so sorry, I need to try if God is calling really me uh, to become priest. So she accepted, we finished the relationship, and I entered the seminary. And I can tell you that after a few weeks, I realized this is my place. I was so happy, deeply happy up to now. Now, as part of my formation, I study philosophy with the Jesuits, being a Scalabrinian seminarian in my town, Guadalajara, for three years. From there, I was moved to another state called Michoacán, a little town called Purépero, very little town. There, I did my postulancy, six months, and my novitiate. Now, I have a dilemma during my formation. What was the dilemma? To become a brother, religious brother, or religious brother and priest. At a certain point, the novice master asked me, Ignacio, you need to write down your letter if you want to become priest, because we need to see where the superior's base in Rome will send you to study. If you want to become brother, there are specific places to study. So I remember that the novice master told me, you are the last one among nine that you haven't given to me your letter and tomorrow is the deadline. So I remember that night I was praying in the chapel all night. Lord, inspire me, what do you want from me? To be a religious missionary or to be a religious missionary and priest? And you know what, at a certain point, in my deep conversation with the Lord, I had this intuition. If you will become religious, missionary, and priest, you only not talk about me. You will not only serve people on my behalf, but also you will bring me to them physically through my body and precious blood. At that moment, I connected when I was experiencing going to Chiapas. And I remember these people telling me that once a year priest goes there and they were hungry to receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ. So at the end I said, yes, I want to become religious, missionary, and priest. I accepted. As conclusion of this, I was asked to go to Chicago where I did my studies. I did my diaconate in Los Angeles, California. 
I have wonderful experiences as part of my formation. I was exposed to work with different ethnic groups like Filipinos, like Guatemalans, like Yugoslavians. In other words, that opportunity of being a migrant with migrants in the United States opened my heart, my heart, but also my mind, really to become a migrant with them, to be a religious missionary. Hello, Father. Hello, hi. Thank you for inviting me to be here. I understand that you did some, you did your formation uh, in Mexico and in America, and then after that you started doing some work in Indonesia. Correct. Um, as a vocational promoter. Vocational promoter. Yeah. Now, in your time as a vocational promoter, was there any experience or conversation or time with an individual that you can think of that you really helped someone make a decision about their vocation? First of all, a vocational promoter is the, the person who accompany in the process to someone who tried to discover what God wants from, from him, right? One of the most common things that I found in Indonesia is the culture to depends on what the parents says. If the parents agree that you will enter in the seminary, they will go for it. Even though you feel strong that you want, but if parents, mom, dad, they don't want you to go into the seminary, even though you feel it, it's the end. Mm. And they will follow mom and dad, even though they know deep in the heart that they are called wow. to serve the Lord. So it's something very interesting, it's culture. So as vocational promoter, beside listening, is to help the, the candidate uh, to take uh, let us say, a serious discernment through prayer, but also to identify the signs that normally God gave us. I remember one particular case that um, this uh, young, young man was afraid to take the decision. He knew deep in his heart that God was calling him to serve fully, mm. um, uh, working and serving for the people of God, but he was afraid yeah. to leave mom and dad. Uh, also, uh, he was concerned because of social, uh, social pressure, the peers, friends saying, hey, when you're gonna be married? Mm -hmm. Okay, what about your children? What about your future family? So all this uh, pressure really challenged this candidate mm -hmm. and he was disturbed and even a kind of lost. So it was a big dilemma in his life. So when the vocational promoter entered into his life, so, and I met him, and after listening, his main concerns was the time for me to accompany him, to say, first of all, relax. You don't need to take decisions right away. Mm. It's a discernment process. Mm. And it's true, eh? You see yourself in that candidate once, exactly right. once upon a time. I was like you. So when you share your experience, they realize, the candidates realize that, okay, it's normal. It's normal what I'm feeling. Now, your time um, in Indonesia um, isn't where your story finishes. Obviously, um, you were called elsewhere and, and sent elsewhere. And I understand oh, that yes. another place you went was um, yes. Christmas Island. Right. Uh, just before uh, Christmas Island, I spent six years as vocational promoter and formator in Indonesia. In Indonesia. Yeah. And from there, I was asked to go to the Philippines. To the, the Philippines? Philippines. The south part of the Philippines is the second biggest city called Cebu. Mm -hmm. And I was a director of the postulancy. And I have, uh, like, for among three years, or let us say around 70, 80 mm -hmm. students uh, coming from Vietnam from Indonesia and from the Philippines. And uh, the same process, to accompany them, okay, discerning together, helping them to identify the signs of God in their lives, right? And, uh, and from that experience that was very enriching, uh, I was asked by my superiors to move to Australia. Now, uh, in the meantime, I had the experience to come to Australia several times while I was still working in Asia. 
And one of these experiences precisely was to work in Christmas Island. So you were saying just a moment ago about having your superiors asking you to move yes. from place to place. And obviously you've lived in Mexico and Philippines and Indonesia and now in Australia and also Christmas Island. Um, when it comes to those hard movements of life or changes in life and changes of place, um, how, how, how does that go for you? Like having to change country and, yeah. and the people around it's you? It's not easy, I can tell you, uh, and, but at the same time, it has meaning to us because first of all, we are missionaries. Yes. We are religious missionaries. We have three vows. Among these vows is the vows of obedience. So you obey. And, and we believe God is inspiring our superiors where God wants us to be, where God wants us to serve. And so it is why uh, it's a confidence that God is inspiring the superiors, mm. right? It's not easy in the sense that you need to adapt yourself to the new reality, yeah. to speak the language, to eat their own food, <laughs> local food, mm. to understand the values, the system, it takes time, right? But again, uh, what is, in my opinion, important is that you see behind the new um, assignment, you see that God's will is there, is present there. For a reason, God is asking me to go to that particular mm. place. I will learn something new, and I will share God's, God's presence to these people that I will meet. So your time on Christmas Island was obviously a very unique calling it for was, you in your was. story, because you were working with refugees, is that right? Right. Our charism, we mm. Calabrians, our main, let us say, um, mission is to work with migrants, mm. right? Refugees and seafarers. What did your ministry look like when you were working with um, refugees. When I am, well, it's practically to be present and to share with them that God is already accompanying them. How I say that? Not necessarily to talk about God because most of the asylum seekers that I met in Christmas Silence, they were not Christians, right? But the, the, the attitude to listen to with interest, mm. carefully, yeah. attentively, uh, being uh, close to them, already they appreciated and they saw something there that they were looking for, they were desiring to, uh, is what I call God's presence, right? Again, I never talk about religion, mm. okay? But the way how I share with them uh, my own expectations about mm. life, my own hopes, and giving them strength and uh, encourage them to keep going in their lives, uh, to find a meaning in their lives, and it uh, was a, a kind of a brotherhood, really. It's a kind of a, a strong family. You are with them, they are suffering, and you don't have any idea how much suffering is there for these sino seekers that need to leave their country, not because they want, because they need to survive. But now in Australia, you have a very different ministry. You're working as a parish priest and a chaplain for um, the Latin American Latin community. American community. Yeah. Um, what does your ministry here in Australia look like? Someone asked me a few years ago, uh, Father, which, which kind of pastoral ministry do you prefer? To be a formator and vocational promoter or to be a parish priest and a chaplain for the Latin American community? And I would like to say is the two sides of the coin. Mm. For me, again, it's enriching experience because now I administer the sacraments. I listen to the people. I am present with them. I accompany them in the process, right? And I, I identify that uh, part of my mission is to help the people, local people, to discover God already present among them. It's already here. In other words, I am not coming to Australia to bring Jesus. No, Jesus is here. My task is through walking with them, through listening to them, through being with them, to help them to identify signs where God is present in their lives, yeah. okay? The second is to help them to be closer and closer to God.
A key part of our relationship with God is overcoming the hard parts of our lives, the, the temptations and, and those kinds of things that we come up against. What are some of the tips or some of the, the I guess, advice that you might have about how you overcome those temptations and those harder parts of your life? Yes. First of all, don't be afraid of temptations. Because at the moment that the person is afraid of temptations, you are giving your power to the temptations. Mm. To put a sane distance, a healthy distance on one hand. On the other hand, of course, pray your life. It's very important to intimate with the source of your vocation. Uh, it's a combination of attitudes, but also concrete actions that we need to do. So of course, is an action. Yes, of course, you need the support of a community. I, in my case, as religious, I have other brothers that we share uh, struggles, our struggles. Uh, I need a spiritual director. I need a confessor. All these uh, tools uh, help me to keep going with the, the passion that I need to keep going with my mission. So it's not only one action, it's not only one discernment. They are constant discernments and constant actions that we need to do. Mm. My first mission, I believe, personally, is to take care of my vocation because my vocation is a gift. Wow. If I'm taking care of my vocation, I can do my mission. But if I focus in the mission, on in actions, and I forget about my call, I need to take care of my call, I will be lost on the way. Father, this is the 15th year as a priest, is that yes, right? Yes. So in those 15 years as a priest, um, what do you think have been maybe the top, let's say, three um, moments that you've had as a priest that are most memorable, <laughs> most cherished in your heart? So many beautiful experiences. My mom passed away five years ago, but uh, the last time I went to see her and she was still healthy, she uh, accompanied me to the airport be just before coming back to Australia. And often a sudden she started to cry. And I say, Mom, don't cry. You know what I am doing. And don't be sad. And she looked at me and she told me, who told you that I'm sad? Who told you? I'm, I am not sad. I'm crying because I'm happy that the Lord chose you to be his servant as missionary religious priest. Wow. And that I understood very well because I cried many times. I found myself in my room, and often a sudden, I, I can feel the tears coming down. And I realized, I'm, I'm a sad, I am I'm a sad. No, I am not sad. So what is going on? And I realized, I'm happy. I'm happy because God chose me mm. to be his servant. Wow. So when my mom told me that experience, I understood her perfectly. And another experience that I remember was precisely when I was ordained priest. At the moment when um, I just was consecrated by the bishop and then they put on the, the chasuble, my father and my mom came and they put on me the chasuble and my dad started to cry, but he embraced me. He couldn't say too many things at that moment, but the tears told me a lot of things already how grateful he was, how uh, happy he was, how wonderful moments he received through half a son committed to God. But at the same time, I realized that how generous were my mom and my dad giving one of their children to the church. And lately, last year, I had the opportunity to, to be in Rome because uh, my congregation, we just had a general chapter through which we elect the new general, superior, and the general administration. So after the election, we had a, a meeting with the, the Pope Francis. Hey. It was my first time to see the Pope too close, <laughs> all the time through the TV, far away. And uh, he was so humble and simple that I was so touched. At the end, he allowed us to, to approach him one by one. We were 43 
uh, priest, all of us is Calabrinians. And I noticed that every single priest started to say, Your Holiness, please bless North America, uh, Europe, South America, Africa. And I realized, uh oh, I will pray for Australia and for all of us Australians living and working here. So I did it. And uh, what impressed me was that the eye contact. I was talking to him and he never was distracted. He looked at my eyes all the time. I, f I felt so dignified, mm. so worthy at that moment. And uh, besides, uh, he grabbed my, my, not only my hand, but my arm. It's a physical contact, eye contact. All as a, as a, whole, uh, as a, as a complete human being paying attention to me. And I felt like I was talking with my, my dad, my father, a real father. It was a, a, a very deep moment as a human being, as a Christian, and even as a religious missionary priest. Thank you so much for joining us today, Father. I know from what you've shared, it's, it's meant, meant a lot to me to hear your story and hear um, your experience and your journey. Um, so thank you so much. You are more than welcome. Thank you for having me. Shalom World brings to you the Catholic faith in all its different dimensions. It can be a faith to inspire you in, in your own living of your Catholic life in society. Shalom World offers you an opportunity of being rich and strengthened in your family life. We live in a culture that needs to have a Catholic presence. We live in a culture that needs to be evangelized by the presence of Catholic teaching and the inspiration to live according to our Catholic way of life. I recommend to you you're involved, to be involved in the work of Shalom World. May the Lord bless you and bless the work of Shalom World. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.